Good evening, everybody. Just waiting for everybody to join. We're currently live streaming on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so please be aware of that. We are asking all participants to remain muted um, if they are not the hosts, just for better audio quality. And if you want to ask questions, please do so by writing in the Zoom chat function. And I will pass that along to our Vice President, David Mendoza-Wolfson, who's going to be interviewing our amazing speaker, Naftali, tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the official start of tonight's event to Efrat Perry, who's the Director of Public Diplomacy at the Israeli Embassy. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this unique event. My name is Efrat Perry, and I'm the Director of Public Diplomacy Department in the Israeli Embassy here in the UK. As part of my role, I have the privilege of overseeing the embassy's engagement with the Jewish community. And since I arriving in the UK about two months ago, I, I have the priv I, sorry, I had the pleasure of getting to know British Jewry, a community that is diverse and dynamic, open and welcoming. The vitality of British Jewry is also mirrored in Israeli society, a country which is a home to Jews from a variety of places, cultures, and ethnicities. I am delighted that we are celebrating Israel's diversity this evening by marking SIG, a holiday unique to the Ethiopian Jewish community. The holiday, which took place last week, 50 days after Yom Kippur, solidify the covenant between God, the Jewish people, and the Torah. Sig is typically marked with festivals, ceremonies, and pilgrimage. I'm sure Naftali, who I am happy and pleased that was able to join us tonight, will share his insights into Sig, as well as Ethiopian Jewry, long and proud story in more detail. But I would like to quickly reflect on the importance of the Ethiopian community on shaping Israel's cultural landscape with major stars such as Eden Alena uh, gaining international acclaim, as well as note the major role Ethiopian Jews played in Israel's public sphere, both politics and diplomacy. Before handing over to David to properly introduce our guest speaker, I would like to thank the Board of Deputies for partnering with us on this important event. I would like to thank the team uh, at the board as well as our team at the embassy for the hard work in putting together the event this evening. I hope you have an enjoyable evening. Thank you, Efrat, uh, and good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure tonight uh, to introduce our speaker, Naftali Aklum. Uh, Naftali was born in Ethiopia in 1979. The following year in 1980, he and his parents were among the first to make Aliyah to Israel via Sudan in what later became known as Operation Moses. He's the youngest of 12 brothers and sisters. Uh, Naftali's late brother, Faradi Aklum, was the first Ethiopian Jew to make the journey to Jerusalem via Sudan, with Faradi then setting the stage for others to follow. After reaching Sudan in 1978, the letter Faradi wrote requesting assistance to make Aliyah found its way to Menachem Begin, who then set in motion the remarkable secret operation. In his footsteps, literally over 8,000 to 12,000, uh, sorry, 8,000 of 12,000 successfully reached Jerusalem after 2,500 years of yearning. Naftali was raised and educated in Beersheba, uh, he graduated from Ben-Gurion University in 2008 with a concentration in politics, government, history, and Middle Eastern studies. Since 2010, he's played a critical role in ENP's uh, Space uh, Scholastic Assistance Program, that's uh, School Performance and Community Empowerment. He's long been involved in sharing the story of Israel and Ethiopian Jewry, including on delegations with uh, ADL, that's the Anti-Defamation League, working with Israel at heart and serving as a mentor to other Ethiopian Israeli academics to assist them in their job placement efforts. As part of the Ethiopian community in Beersheba, Naftali has developed an interesting one day 
educational experience for tourists that focuses on the history, culture, and traditions of Ethiopian Jewry. His objective is to enable the Ethiopian community and in Israel in general to share its unique narrative and cultural treasures with others, to empower the community and to contribute to a pluralistic Israeli society that views its communal diversity as a source of strength. I could go on and on as this hasn't even touched the surface of uh, everything that Naftali has done, uh, but I think it's probably better that I hand over to the man himself. Uh, I, for one, am really looking forward to your presentation. I know everyone else watching here is too. Uh, so thank you very much and over to you, Naftali. So David, thank you so much for the warm introduction. I would like to thank the Embassy of Israel and the Board of Deputies for celebrating the SIGD. It makes me happy because back in Ethiopia, the SIGD was a unique holiday only for the Ethiopian Jews. But now it's a holiday for all the Jews all over the world. So Chag SIGD Samech. Um, my name is Naftali Aklum. As David said, I was born in Ethiopia in 1979 the youngest of 12 brothers and sisters, and my family were among the first group to do the journey from Ethiopia to Sudan and from Sudan to Israel. For this um, lecture, I will use my PowerPoint, and I hope that in the next 40 minutes, you will have as much more info about this lovely and small community, the Beta Israel community. One second. Okay, so one of the main questions that people are asking me is how the black Jews, the Ethiopian Jews arrived to that country in East Africa. We have two versions of how the Ethiopian Jews arrived to Ethiopia. The first and the well-known version is the version of King Solomon and Queen Sheba. Now, as you all know, King Solomon was the wisest man on earth and all the kings and the queens at that time wanted to come to this area to learn and to have some advice from King Solomon. Queen Sheba used to control the countries that we know today, such as Ethiopia, Eritrea, some part of Yemen, some part of Sudan, and some part of Egypt. All this area used to call the ancient Kush. And Queen Sheba was the queen of that area. Now she also heard about King Solomon. She came here, they fell in love, and they brought a son to the world. His name was Menelik, who later became Menelik I, the first king of Ethiopia. When Menelik was 14 years old, he told his mother that he wants to know his father more. He came here, he spent a few months with King Solomon, his father. But after a few months, King Solomon told his son, you have to go back to Ethiopia, Kush. King Solomon didn't send his son alone. He sent thousands of people back with him to Ethiopia Kush. And some believe that we, the Ethiopian Jews, we came out from the thousands of people that King Solomon sent back with his son back to Ethiopia Kush. That's the first version of how the Ethiopian Jews came to Ethiopia. The second version, which is the version that we believe, it's after the destruction of the first temple when King Nebuchadnezzar came and conquered this area, one tribe decided to escape to the south, to Egypt. Now in Egypt, we have the Nile River. This tribe walked through the Blue Nile River until they ended up in Ethiopia. And that's the tribe of Dan. We believe that we are the lost tribe of Dan. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I must tell you that we are speaking about ancient community community that for thousands of years kept Judaism in the diaspora. Now, I don't know how much you know about the history of Ethiopia as a country, but Ethiopia was one of the first countries that accept Christianity in the fourth century. And throughout the history of Ethiopia as a country, kings and queens always wanted to convert the Ethiopian Jewish community to Christianity, but we never let them. Why? because we were isolated. 
which means we never had any relationship to any other Jewish community in the world until the late 19th century. And because of that, we thought that we are the only Jews left in the world. And if we will not keep Judaism, Judaism will disappear. I will tell you even more than that. When the first Ethiopian immigrants came to Israel in the 80s, some of them were surprised to see white Jews because we were isolated. And in Ethiopia, the non-Jews used to call us falasha. Now the meaning of the term falasha, it means a stranger, someone who is not in his land. And the non-Jews always reminded us that we don't belong to Ethiopia. That's why they gave us the bad nickname Falasha. We called ourselves the Beta Israel community. Why? Because we always knew that we are part of Am Israel. Now, in the picture, you can see in the middle my father, my mother and two of my sisters and four of my brothers. All those pictures were taken in Ethiopia. Last Thursday, we celebrated the Sigd holiday. Sigd is a holiday that we used to celebrate in Ethiopia 50 days after Yom Kippur, similar to uh, Shavuot that we celebrate 50 days after Passover. In Ethiopia, we used to climb up to a high mountain with our spiritual lead uh, leaders, the Kesim, who you see in this picture, and on the top of the mountain, we used to fast, we used to pray from the Torah, to read from the Torah, and we were asking God one thing, bring us back home to Zion. This is what we wanted from God, to bring us back home to Zion. In the evening, we used to go down from the mountain, having a big celebration, a big dinner. This holiday, shows the longing of Ethiopian Jews to Jerusalem. This is how we call Jerusalem. And today you will ask, why do you celebrate the sin today in Israel if God fulfill your dream and you are in the land of, uh, uh, in, in Israel? So today we know that God is listening to our prayers because we are here. And today we are asking God to bring peace to its people. Because unfortunately, in the society that I'm living in Israel, we have lots of problems. Sfaradim against Ashkenazim, new immigrants against old immigrants, religious against non-religious. So today, during the Sigd, we're praying to God to bring peace to its people. Um, so as I mentioned before, the Sigd, it's a holiday that we are praying to God and asking God to bring us back home to Zion. So how does it happen that in the end, we fulfill our dream and we made Aliyah to the state of Israel? This year, 1973, a very important year in the history of the Ethiopian Jews, 1973, the Sfaradi chief rabbi, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, may he rest in peace, was the first rabbi to say it loud and clear, Ethiopian Jews are Jews and we have to bring them from Ethiopia to Israel. He was the first one. 1975, the Ashkenaz chief rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Goren, also announced that Ethiopian Jews are Jews and we have to bring them from Ethiopia to Israel. Now, when you have two chief rabbis, one Sfaradi, one Ashkenazi saying that the Ethiopian Jews are Jews, it means that the government of Yitzhak Rabin in 1975 have to apply the law of return on the Ethiopian Jews. And this is exactly what happened. For the first time in 1975, the law of return apply on the Ethiopian Jews the same law that exists in Israel from 1950 uh, uh, apply on the Ethiopian Jews. But even though the law of return apply on the Ethiopian Jews, 
Still, the Ethiopian Jews were not able to come to Israel in 1975. And I will show you the next video that will explain to you the situation in Ethiopia in the 70s and why the Ethiopian Jews, even those a low return apply on them, were not able to come to Israel. Ethiopia, 1974, the last feudal regime collapses, the military takes over. Cheaper try to reach to Jerusalem. Six hundred children. Nineteen seventy-seven in Israel, we had election, and uh, the Likud party won the election for the first time, and the new prime minister is Menachem Begin. Now, one of the first thing that Menachem Begin did as a prime minister was to invite to his office the head of the Mossad then, Yitzhak Hofi, and he told him, "Bring me the Ethiopian Jews." That was one of the first thing that Menachem Begin did as a prime minister. Now the question is, why Menachem Begin wanted so deeply to bring the Ethiopian Jews? Is it because he wanted some future voters for the Likud? But the truth is that in 1975, there was on November 10, 1975, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 3379, according to which Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination. Now, when the Jewish community in America heard about that, they start to put a lot of pressure on the government in America, and not only in the government in America, but also on the government and Yitzhak Rabin, and later on on the government of Menachem Begin. They told them, bring as soon as possible the Ethiopian Jewish community from Ethiopia. Because once you bring black Jews from the continent of Africa to Israel, how can people compare Zionism to racism? So Menachem Begin was under a lot of pressure and in, uh, 1979, November 1979, there was a deal between Ethiopia and Israel. We call it the arm deal. Ethiopia are willing, Israel is willing to give weapon and advice to Mangisto Haile Mariam, the dictator from Ethiopia. And in return, all you have to do is to let some thousands of Ethiopian Jews to leave the country. Now, Mangisto Haile Mariam had a big problem. In Ethiopia at that time, there was a civil war and the TPLF, Tigray People Liberation Front, uh, starting to do her way to the capital city, Addis Ababa. Now, Mangisto Haile Mariam had an offer from the state of Israel to have weapon and advice and to have weapon and advice from a country like Israel it's something that you are not saying no to. 
And Mangisto Haile Mariam agreed to that uh, deal between Ethiopia and Israel, but he had one condition. It's have to be a secret deal. Everyone agreed. And in November, 1977, for the first time, the state of Israel sending Mossad agent to the capital city of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. Now those Mossad agents coming to the big city, they don't speak the national, national language Amharic. They don't understand the culture in Ethiopia, but most important, they don't know exactly where are the Jewish villages, which means they needed help. And they needed help from people within the Jewish community in Ethiopia. And one of the people that they were asking help from was my late brother, sorry, my late brother, Ferede Yazezo Aklu. In the 60s, the organization ORT opened school in the Jewish villages in the northern side of Ethiopia to prepare them for the day that they will make Aliyah. And my brother was a teacher in one of their schools. He had a very good English, and this is why the Mossad agent approached to him and they told my brother, we have a list of 120 Ethiopian Jews from, this is the map of Ethiopia. Ethiopian Jews used to live in the Northern side of Ethiopia in Gonder and in Tigray. In the middle, we have the capital city, Addis Abeba. My brother was a teacher in Gonder. They told my brother, we want to give you a list of 120 Ethiopian Jews from the Gonder area. We want you to find them, organize them, and bring them from Gonder to the capital city so that we will be able to take them to Zion, to Jerusalem. Now the dream of every Jew in Ethiopia, before we are saying the word father and mother, we are saying the word Jerusalem. I don't know how to explain it, but the dream to return, it's something that every Jew had. And my brother had that dream as well. He told the Mossad, if you want me to help, I'm willing to help. But I want to be one of the 120 Ethiopian Jews that are going to fulfill that dream to return back home to Zion. The Mossad people told my brother, it's a pilot. We will have more groups in the future. In the meantime, we do need your help. My brother saw those people coming from Israel to save and rescue his community. He said, I must help them. And this is exactly what he did. He found, organized, and he brought the 120 Ethiopian Jews from Gondor to Addis Ababa, by the way, by bus in the 70s, from Gondor to Addis Ababa. It's about three days on the road. So it's not an easy road, but he did it. And in January, 1978, for the first time, 120 Ethiopian Jews making Aliyah legally to the state of Israel. Few weeks after the group arrived, the foreign minister of the state of Israel at that time was Moshe Dayan. And Moshe Dayan had a press conference in Geneva. And unfortunately, and from a reason that we don't know, Moshe Dayan told the world about the deal between Ethiopia and Israel. When the dictator from Ethiopia heard about that, the first thing that he did was to cancel the deal. The second thing that he did was to tell all the Mossad agents that are in the land of Ethiopia to leave immediately. But he did one more thing. He started to chase after all the Ethiopian Jews activists that took part in this deal. One of them is my brother. My brother, Ferede Azezo Aklu, became a wanted man in his own country. Now, to be a wanted man under the regime of Mangisto Haile Mariam in the 70s in Ethiopia, it means that if they will catch you, you're a dead man. Now, what would you do if you know that your life is at risk? You will run away. Now, let's see the map. The closest country to run to from Gondor is Sudan. Now we have two problems with Sudan. Sudan is a Muslim country. It's not safe for a Jew to be there, but you can hide your identity as Jew. The second problem 
is the, is the distance between Gondor to Sudan. We are speaking about more than 700 kilometers, about 300 miles. Now, if you do it by plane, it's not a big deal. If you do it by car, you can do it. But what about doing it walking in the desert? My brother didn't have any other option. That was the only option for him to save his life. So he went out to a journey in the desert of more than 700 kilometers. In the beginning, he took some amount of money, food, water, but after a few days, less water, less food, he realized that it will be very difficult for him to walk during the day due to the sun in that area of the world. So he was walking mainly at the night. It took him more than a month to do the journey from Gondor to Sudan. When he arrived to Sudan, my brother was weak, thirsty, hungry, dirty, name it he was. The only thing that he had on him that worth something was his wedding ring and a book with some addresses of some Mossad agent that he worked with a few months before in Ethiopia. My brother decided to sell the wedding ring. He earned some money. Now, every normal person, after a journey like this, that have some amount of money, the first thing that he will do will be to buy food, water, to find a place to stay. But my brother took the money. He went to the main post office in Khartoum, Sudan. Khartoum is the capital city of Sudan. And he sent letters to his contacts telling them, it's me, Fereh de Aklum. I'm in Khartoum, Sudan. Please save me. Now, I want you to think about it. 1978, a black guy, a Jewish guy in a Muslim country in East Africa sending letters. He's not quite sure that his letter will arrive, but my brother is waiting and he's waiting another five months. And in those five months, he lived as a homeless in the street of Khartoum. But after five months, ladies and gentlemen, not only that his message arrived. The prime minister of the state of Israel, Menachem Begin, told the Mossad to send a Mossad agent to save my brother from the street of Khartoum. And they sent a young Mossad agent, Daniel Moore. And I will not go into details how Daniel Moore found my brother in the street of Khartoum, but I can tell you it took him only three days. Now, when the two of them met, my brother realized that, hey, I escaped from Ethiopia to Sudan, and from Sudan, the government of Israel is saving me. Maybe, maybe, maybe there is a way to fulfill the dream, not only for myself, but for all the Ethiopian Jews, if they can only come to Sudan. So my brother had to lie to the Mossad agent. He told them, look, Danny, I know that you came here to save me, but I don't know if you know, but there are more Jews here in Khartoum, Sudan. So instead of just taking one Jew, you can save more Jews. My brother knew that there are no Jews in Khartoum, Sudan, but my brother wanted to earn time to bring Jews from Ethiopia to Sudan and so that they will be able to fulfill their dream. So he made a pilot on his family, on my family. And we came and this picture, it's a picture of two of my brother and a cousin that they were the pilot of what we call the journey of Ethiopian Jews from Ethiopia to Sudan. My brother sent um, a, guy from, a guy from Sudan to our village in the Northern side of Ethiopia in the area of Tigray to see if they can come. When they came, my brother took this photo and he sent it as a proof to our parents that they made it and now is their time to do their journey. From 1979, 
until 1984. More than 12,000 Ethiopian Jews left their villages, their house, their land, their properties, going to the unknown. No one promised no one that in the end they will make it to Jerusalem. But the Ethiopian Jews saw an opportunity to fulfill that dream that they are always dreaming, mainly during the Sikh holiday, to return back home to Zion. And when that opportunity came, thousands of Ethiopian Jews were doing their way to Sudan because they knew that in Sudan, there is an opportunity. When my family started this journey, I was six months old. I wanted to think about babies, adults that have to do a journey of more than 300 miles. In my village, we had an old man, 82 years old. His family asked him not to live. They knew he will not make it. The old man told his family, I rather die on my way to Jerusalem. I will not stay here. And unfortunately, he died on the way. Out of the 12,000 Ethiopian Jews that left, 4,000 Ethiopian Jews didn't make it and died on the way. More than 600 children. When the Ethiopian Jews arrived to Sudan, they put them in refugee camps. And in those, refu in those refugee camps, we had our own little Holocaust. Every day, between 10 to 20 people died due to the food that they gave them in the refugee camps, disease in the refugee camps. Many Ethiopian Jewish women were raped by Sudanese soldiers. And they were doing all this just because they wanted to fulfill a dream. I will show you a video now from the refugee camps because I do want you to understand how much the Ethiopian Jews had to sacrifice to live here today in Israel. את המכתב הזה לאנשים שלעולם לא יקראו אותו. זהו ניסיון נואש לעורר את זכרם שנשכח בתוך ים של זיכרונות עצובים בארץ מוכת האסונות הזאת. הפסימים יטענו שאני מעורר מתים, הציניקנים יצלמו שאני מגזים, אבל אני חרד שאתם תשכחו מבלי שאף אדם ישים לב. אתם לא מאה ולא מתי, אלא ארבעת אלפים איש ואישה. זקנים וטף, שהאמינו שמקומם כאן, ניסיתם להגשים את חלומכם, ויצאתם למסע רגלי מפרך, דרך ג'ונגלים סבוכים, נערות גויים ומדבריות אימתניים, שבהם רוצחים ואנסים מטילי אימה וחסרי לב, אבל נשארתם שם, במרחב האינסופי, קבורים בתוך אדמה זרה בקבר לא מסומן, לא מעט מכם, מבלי שאיש הניח חפר על גופותיכם. אך למרות הסכנות, המשכתם לצאת בעמוניכם למסע שכמדומני לא היה כמותו מאז יציאת מצרים. צעדתם בלילות ובימים, והגעתם אל סודן הארורה. סודן פערה את פיה ואיימה לטרוף את כולנו מבלי להשאיר זכר. לא מעט מכם גרו בשכנות אליי, באותם מחנות פליטים שהפכו למלכודת מוות מדי בוקר עם זריחת השמש. גברים חסונים, אמהות רחומות, וילדים שטרם טעמו את טעם החיים, נבלו שם כפרחים בשמש. כמו כל אלה שהיו שם, נאלצתי לראות אתכם גוועים מול עיניי, וליוויתי אתכם לאותם מקומות מסתור שנקראו גברים. לא אשכח את הלילות, בהם ידענו איך להיפטר מגופותיכם בסתר, הרחק מעיניהם של גויים עוינים. לא אשכח את הימים, בהם הפנים היו חרושות דמעות יבשות, ולא את רגעי הייאוש וחוסר האונים. לא אשכח איך כל דאגותיי היו לאלה שישארו בחיים אחריי, ויצטרכו לסכן את עצמם בחיפוש אחר מקום לקבור את גופתי. בסודן הארורה איבדנו את כבודנו האנושי האחרון. משפחותיהם של אחדים מכם נמחקו כאילו לא נקראו לעולם. ילדים נותרו יתומים, הורים שקלו את ילדיהם, גברים איבדו את נשותיהם, 
ונשים נותרו ללא בעלים. את כל זה עשיתם כדי להגיע אל ארץ נחלתכם, אך לשווא. בארץ שחלמתם לחיות בה, האנשים חיים בקצב מסחרר, והזיכרון שלהם קצר מאוד. אנשים שאפילו לא זוכרים את המלחמה של הקיץ האחרון, ובוודאי שאין להם זמן לזיכרון העבר. ואני חרד שזיכרונכם יישאר נחלת מעטים, ויתפוגג לו בחלוף הדור שחווה את המסע על בשרו. As you know, in Israel, we celebrate Jerusalem Day. We celebrate the release of Jerusalem from the Jordanian in 1967. So every year we celebrate that day. On Jerusalem Day, we, the Ethiopian Jews, remember the 4,000 Ethiopian Jews that were not able to see Jerusalem. And we have ceremonies all over the country. The main event is in Mount Herita alongside the president and the prime minister of Israel, and we do have to remember them. I lost my grandfather in Sudan, and if you will go over Ethiopian Jewish families here in Israel, almost every family lost someone in Sudan, and every family have that trauma from Sudan. But thank God I made it uh, with my family, and uh, one of the first city that received the Ethiopian Jews in 1980 was the city of Beersheba, the capital city of the Negev. And this is me, you can see me in the picture. Um, to grow up here was very challenging. It was not easy. I grew up in a neighborhood that had about 90% Ethiopian Jews. The school that I went had the same amount, uh, which means when you wake up in the morning and go to school and from school, go back to your home, all you see is your community. As well, when you put a lot of people from low economic status in one neighborhood, you will eventually create a neighborhood that will have drugs, alcohol, crime, and violence. And if you don't have parents that will show you the limit, you will probably find yourself one day behind bars. When I was a kid, I was suffering from identities problem. In one hand, I'm a proud Israeli, a proud Jew, but in the other hand, I didn't like the color of my skin. I didn't like being a black man. Because in the early 80s, in the periphery here in Israel, from time to time, people used to nickname us Negro Samba and you know things like that. And as a kid, I was asking God, I remember that I was you know, closing the door of my room and, and, and asking God, why did you brought me to this world as a young black man? If it's not easy to be a black man in a country that her vast majority is white, even though we live among our brothers and sisters. And it was, it was something that was very hard for me. In the age of 18, as you all know, here it's mandatory and we have to go to the army and we understand why we have to defend and protect our country. I served in the Air Force as a firefighter for three years. And then, um, and it was a great experience. Being in the army beyond giving back to your country, uh, for me, it was a great experience because during that time, I had the privilege to see the Israeli society. That was the time, the first time that I saw the one from the kibbutz, the one from the moshav, the one from Tel Aviv. And it was a great, great experience for me. After the army, uh, as Israelis do, um, you know, they taking the best years in the man life from the age of 18 till 21. And after three years in the army, we want a year off and we are traveling. I traveled to South Asia for one year. And then I came back and I did my first degree studying political science and government in Ben Gurion University. 
And then I started to work in the educational system here in Israel. Now in a man life, there is always a point that can change your life. My point came when I arrived at the age of 30. I went back for the first time to a root strip back to Ethiopia. I saw a beautiful country with beautiful culture. I went back to the village that I was born. I saw friends of my family. They told me about my father, about my mother, about the Jewish community that used to live there and how one night all the Jews left. When I returned from this trip, I returned a different person. I'm more proud Jew because to be there in East Africa, in that country, in Ethiopia, and to see the place that your forefathers came to Judaism immediately will make you feel even more proud Jew. Proud Israeli to see the situation that my forefathers used to live in Ethiopia will make you feel immediately more proud Israeli. But none less important, I came back from Ethiopia, a proud black man. Black is beautiful. And this is me. I took all my little identities, being Israeli, being Jew and being black, and I created one strong identity, identity that I'm proud of. And society will always see you the way you see yourself. If you see yourself as weak, this is how people will look at you. But if, if you see yourself as a strong man, this is how society will see you. When I returned from Ethiopia, my father in his last years was a very sick man. He was in Soroka Hospital in Beersheba. So the first stop for me would be to visit my dad and to share with him my experience. I sat down in his room in the hospital. He didn't speak, so I had to whisper to his ears. And I told my dad, dad, I just came back from Ethiopia. I saw your house. I saw some of your friend, they send you regards. But I told him one more thing. I told my dad, dad, I love you. I admire you and you are a hero to me. You see, we grow up looking at our parents as weak people. They came here, they didn't speak the language. They didn't have a job. And they were <clears throat> always rely on government money. And as kids, we always saw them as weak people. But when I understood what my parents did in order to come and to fulfill their dream to return back home to Zion, I understood that my parents are heroes. And if you ask me, I'm not sure. I was doing the same thing as they did, but they did it. So I told my father that I'm proud of him. Unfortunately, 10 days after that, he passed away. It was like he was waiting for me to say this word so that he will be able to rest in peace. And I'm happy I did it. And I hope he is resting in peace. Um, I had a good job with good salary. But sometimes when you wanna make a change in the society you're living in, you have to take big risks. I had, and I realized that the story of my community is very, uh, uh, is not well known in the society that I'm living. And because of that, people don't know who we are. And yes, we do suffer from time to time from racism, discrimination, police brutality. I love my country. I don't have any other country. That's the country that I will live and I will die in. But when you see something that is not right, you want to change it. You want to do, you want to correct it. And when I saw the problem that we have, I realized that education is the key. And the more people will know who we are, the more we will create a better society to live in. You see the main problem, and a lot of people think that the biggest threat to the state of Israel, it's the Palestinian or Iran, that's a problem as well. But the biggest threat to the state of Israel 
it's ourself. You see, I don't know enough about the story of the Jewish community from Russia. The Jewish community from Russia don't know enough about the story of the Jewish community from Argentina and so on and so on. And from my little place, I'm trying to take the story of my community and to share it with my brothers and sisters, not only here, but all over the world. Two years ago, I, I was in London and I spoke um, in one of the events uh, of Ort. And one of the people came to me and asked me, are you from Brixton? Brixton in England, Brixton in London. And I told him, no, I'm from Israel. You see, for a lot of people outside of this country, when they have the image of the Jew, it's mainly white European Jew. I'm here to show the diversity within Jewish people. It's not only one color. We have Jews from Yemen. We have Jews from India. And that's the beauty of us, the diversity within us. Um, and I opened my social venture, Virus, which is aim is to bring to the forefront the story of the Ethiopian Jews. Um, I think I spoke more from the time that they gave me, uh, but I would like to end this presentation with some word of our former prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, speak about the importance of the story of the Ethiopian Jews to the Israeli society and to Jews all over the world. Okay. 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 החברה הישראלית אינה יודעת על המנהיגים ורוצה לדרך. הם נתנו על עצמם סיכון חיים, ורצו דרך לרבבות של המשפחות להגיע לצביעות. הם יצאו עם מישון לילה, הייתם עם עשרון מטלטלים קטן, צעדו בלילות, ואחד שהם עוד קילומטרים, תוך התמודדות עם כל הקשיים שבדרך. כמו שהפיזי, ההליכה על הלא נודע, התקפות של שודדים, יוצאים, צמא, רעב, מחלות. אין משפחות רבות לא עמדו במאמץ, צריך רצון לברזל, חלום לפעמי הממשלה, כדי להתמודד עם כל האתגרים האלה. היה לכם את זה, הייתה לכם פנייה עתיקת יומי, דרך מאוד, ציון, תמונה של הפרפת המשפחות למשרד המלחמה. עד היום כמעט יום מבר ולא סופר סיפור התורה הזה. ראיתי יש הזדמנות לתקן, ראיתי יש הזדמנות להבין סיפור עלייה כלפי אתיופיה. כחלק מפסיפס סיפורי העלייה של הגבוהים, לא חלקי גדול. ומה הסיפור שלכם, והרג ההיסטוריה שלנו, חסר, אני רוצה לממן את החסר, ומבקש להודות ליוזמי הכנס, על ההזדמנות להבין בכיוונת השיח הציבורי, את סיפור הגבורה יוצא הדופן של פרדה זזו אקלו, זכרו לברכה. פרדה, החלוט שפרץ יחד עם ראשי המוסר, את הנתיב לעלייתם של יהודי אתיופיה לישראל דרך סודן. בעקבותם באו את רבים. כל אחד תרם כמידת יכולתו. אבל נחזור בפרוטם היום, שהם יתארו מעבר לאינטרסים המשפחתיים והאישיים הצרים, וסיימו לקהילה כולה. הייתה שכזו, אומץ פרם שכזו, אלה דרומים שיהיו דרך עקרון לדור הבא של יהודי ישראל. בזכותם אחים. So I would like 
once again to thank the embassy and the board of deputies and to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to listen to the story of my community. And uh, hope, I hope that I will see you here as soon as possible. If not, we'll see you one day in London. And um, always remember, I'm Israel Chai. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Naftali. Uh, fortunately, I think we've still got some, some time for questions. So if, if you're still happy to take them, uh, I'd, I'd love to ask. I, I, they've been uh, being sent across to us. So um, just to, to get started, um, do you think you could uh, tell us a little bit about if there's a secular religious divide amongst the Ethiopian uh, Jewish community in Israel? Well, um, this is something that happened uh, not only with the Ethiopian Jews, but all uh, communities that came uh, from the 50s, 60s. Uh, our parents are very relig religious. They pray three times a day. They're keeping the Shabbat. And they are very, very religious. But something happened uh, to the young generation. And they became uh, secular. And they don't practice. And uh, they don't keep Shabbat and all this. For example, I... I don't keep Shabbat, but I, I, you know, I believe in God and, 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 and you know, but, we, but most of the young generation are, are not religious, but you will have a lot of uh, Ethiopian Jews, young Ethiopian Jews that became Haredim, which is something that we never had in Ethiopia. So we have uh, secular and Haredim as well. That's right. It's really interesting. Um, that's a, a fascinating uh, sort of pollination of uh, different cultural backgrounds. Like um, you acted as a, a consultant on the Red Sea diving resort film. Uh, yeah. What do you think about uh, Ethiopian Jewish representation uh, in, in both that film, but also just generally in, in film and, and popular culture? Well, um, for those people who didn't see the movie, uh, the Red Sea Diving Resort, it's a Hollywood movie that tells the story of how the Mossad brought the Ethiopian Jews from Sudan to Israel. In this movie, we have actors such as uh, Chris Evans. By the way, Chris Evans is playing the same Mossad agent that came to save my brother from the street of Khartoum. And the one that played my brother, it's Michael K. Williams. I don't know if people here saw the series The Wire. Uh, we have uh, Omar over there. And uh, he played my brother. Ben Kingsley is playing a uh, Mossad agent as well. And if you didn't see the movie, it's on Netflix. So go and watch the movie. My role in this movie, I was image consulate for this movie. And uh, we filmed this movie in South Africa and in Zimbabwe. And if you ask me if I'm satisfied from the end result of this movie, well, I'm not satisfied because this movie is keeping the saving narrative, which we are trying to change. Uh, you see, over the years, uh, the state of Israel always, um, and, and we have a lot of gratitude for the Navy, for the Air Force, for the Mossad, for what they did. Uh, we are very thankful, but always they, remember to told us the story of our parents, what they did in order to come. Uh, and this movie is keeping that narrative. So you will ask me, why did you uh, work with them if they keeping that narrative? Because when people see the movie, the first thing that they will like and want to do is to go to the internet and Google Ethiopian Jews. It tease you to learn more about the Ethiopian Jews. And when Hollywood telling you to make a movie, you don't say no, you go and do it. But I, I can tell you that today I'm working with uh, uh, a production from Australia on another movie, this time from the point of view of the Ethiopian Jews. That's fantastic. Uh, when are we likely to see that? Well, uh, we, we see working. We want to do it good. <laughs> uh, we see working on that. Oh, we're going to be looking forward to that one, I'm sure. Um, for, for so long, the, the story of Ethiopian Jewry uh, has kind of been seen as a, a hidden history uh, for, for many of us, something that you touched on in your presentation. Uh, what, what do you think that 
in the diaspora who come from uh, different backgrounds, not, not Ethiopian Jewish backgrounds, can do to help share your story? Well, um, well, you all of you heard today what I had to say. And tomorrow we're having Arukhat Shishi. We're accepting the Shabbat. And I hope that uh, all of you have big families. And if not, just tell the story that you heard today, tomorrow evening. And spread the rumors, spread the message. Uh, and, and, and the more we will do that, and I'm serious, I'm telling you, if the government of Israel will see the story of the Ethiopian Jews the way I see it, we, not only, not only the government, but all the Jewish communities all over the world, for example, in England, you know, we have a big problem doing PR for the state of Israel, public relations. And when someone like me come and speak, I touch the heart of the black person in England as well. Because I'm black and I'm a Jew at the same time. And, and, and when he will hear me, I know the experience that he had as a black man every day. So the more people will hear us, the more we can straight relationship between the Jewish community in London and the Jamaican community in Brixton as well in America, the Jewish community in America and the Africans Americans in America. So I hope we will do it uh, more and more, but just share the story, share the story. This is what all of you can do. Absolutely, well, uh, you know, we're really pleased to be able to help share it today and certainly are gonna continue doing what we can uh, to, to share it wider still. Um, fortunately, we've seen more and more Ethiopian Jews in high-level positions in Israeli politics uh, and in the public sphere. That obviously, uh, Eden, Israel's uh, latest uh, Eurovision entrant, who didn't do uh, quite as well as many of us were were hoping, but uh, so is life. Uh, what more do you think can be done uh, to encourage Ethiopian Jews to enter the the public sphere? Well. Uh... We are on, on a journey, and, and that journey started when we came here. As I mentioned before, it was very difficult. But today, we have lots of good things as well. We still have lots of challenges as a community, but at the same time, we have lots of success. You mentioned uh, in the politics area, we have uh, uh, the Minister of Immigration, She's from our community, a woman, Plina Tamano Shata. We have a Knesset members, but not, not only this, we have doctors, we have a pilot, but the most important thing, David, is 15 years ago, we didn't have people that had degree from uh, college or communities. That was like one out of 10, something like this. Today, and from, and due to the help of the government of Israel, because if you are an Ethiopian Jew that made idea from 1980, and you are motivated and you want to go and have a degree from a college or university, you don't have to pay for that. All you need to do is study and study. And today you will find a lot of people from my community uh, that have degree. And when you have degree, there is a big possibility that you will find a good job. When you have a good job, you will have a good salary. When you have good salary, you will be able to leave the old neighborhood and to create a better future for your own family. And this is what we see today. Uh, so yeah, challenges and success in the same time. No, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's great to see the successes and you know, of course there will continue to be challenges and you know again our community here wants to do everything we can uh, to to help you uh, overcome those challenges of course on, on tuesday the earlier uh, and interior ministers 
agreed to expedite the process to airlift thousands of Ethiopians with first degree relatives in Israel. Uh, yeah. What lessons can we learn about the introduction, uh, the integration, sorry, I should say, of the first wave uh, of Aliyah from Ethiopia to make sure they prosper in Israeli society? Uh, say it again, I didn't hear you well. Uh, sorry, uh, what, what, what lessons can, can be learned and, uh, from the integration of the first wave of Aliyah, of the Ethiopian Jewish community from Ethiopia, uh, to make sure that this new wave is able to, to prosper in Israeli society? Well, uh, you know, um, well, it's different now because they have us here and we can help them to integrate to the new society as soon as possible. One of the biggest mistakes that the state of Israel did in the first wave, you see most of the Ethiopian Jews are farmers. And instead of taking them to big cities, they should have taken them to the Mushabim and Kibbutzim. And when you have uh, people that know how to work the land, they are farmers and they are good farmers. Uh, that was a win-win situation uh, for the people and for the government because uh, when you bring them and you bring them to the cities and they are not educated, it means that you will have to put a lot of money on them. But if they are working first, they keeping their dignity and not, not, not only this, they making money. Uh, so I hope that this group that will come will be able to uh, be in Moshavim and Kibbutzim and, and to do something that they know the best, uh, uh, to do the best, to be farmers and to create their own uh, 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 money and, 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 and to make a progress. Right, yeah, thank you. Um, I suppose sticking with some of this uh, governmental stuff, in, in September, the Israeli government uh, approved it, it a, a budget with, I think, 156 million shekel budget uh, aimed at creating equal opportunity, combating discrimination, and integrating the Isra uh, Ethiopian Israeli community into general society uh, in, in as many ways possible. Uh, what more can the Jewish diaspora do uh, to, to combat this discrimination? Well, all these projects are very good and very important. But as I mentioned before, education is the key. And if people will not study the story of the Ethiopian Jews, and they did not only the story of the Ethiopian Jews, the story of all the communities, um, if this will not happen in the educational system, it will, it will be very difficult. So the best way is education and the educa educational system must put the story of all the communities in school so that children will study them from early age. And the more they will learn, as I mentioned before, we will create a better society, a society that will respect each other, will, uh, uh, will I don't know, just respect each other. So education, David. Yeah, no, um, absolutely fundamental. And um, are you uh, in touch with many Jews in Ethiopia, or many people in Ethiopia still? And do you think you could tell us a, a bit more about the situation for those Jews who are remaining in Ethiopia uh, today, particularly in the light of the, the current difficulties and, and conflict over that? Yes, yeah, so uh, as you all know, in Ethiopia right now, there is a war between the northern side and the government uh, in Addis. And uh, we have Jews in camps in Gondar. And in Addis Ababa, we're speaking about about 8,000 Ethiopian remain Jews that's still waiting there. And the community here are very afraid that they will suffer and die due to the war that's happening right now in Ethiopia. So uh, we're putting a lot of pressure uh, on the government and thank God we have uh, the, uh, the minister, uh, Pnina Tamano Shata, uh, that also putting a lot of pressure on the government to bring them as soon as possible. There is no time to wait or delay. 
we have to bring them now and uh, due to the situation that's happening and the war in Ethiopia right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you, you spoke also uh, before about the importance of, of education and also, also about uh, growing up in, I suppose, a, a fairly monolithic uh, society in terms of everybody around you was from uh, your same uh, community. How do you feel the education is in Israel of the Ethiopian uh, Israeli community today? So, so I, I, I will tell you my, my own story. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, so they send us to religious school. Um, and most of the time we were studying, you know, religious stuff. And my father, who was someone that believed in education, did something that at that time it was very weird. He took me out from the religious schools and he put me in one religious school because the education over there, it's much more better than the religious school. And that was like weird thing that my, that my father did in, in his community. And, and today, the generation of today understand the importance of education. And people are giving private lesson to their children if they can. And if not, there is the Ethiopian National Project in Israel that can give private lesson to children to close the gap if they have gap in schools. Um, and, and, and so it's starting in school. And then people understand, like you go to the army, you do, you travel for three months, six months, and people understand that after the trip, you're coming here to study uh, uh, for a degree. So it's something that it's in the head of people. People understand that, that if they will not study, they will not make a progress. They will stay where they are. And I'm happy that people understood the importance of education for their own life. And, uh, but I must tell you, David, most of the Ethiopian Jewish women, trust me, the world belongs to the, uh, the, the, the ladies and gen the ladies. The future belongs to the ladies. And I see it in my community. I see it in my community. The women are the one that going to study, are opening their career. And, 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 and it's amazing. And I'm happy. And um, yeah, you know, that's, that's beautiful to see with your own eyes as someone who lived here 41 years and I saw the situation back then and I see the situation right now, it gives me hope. And hope is something very important. If you don't have hope, then you don't have life. If my parents didn't have hope, they would not come here. They had hope. And the hope, is the one that kept them going on in this journey. So I see hope for my community. I see hope. That's, I mean, that's really, yeah, I'm frankly in, inspiring. Sorry, I'm a little lost for words. And you talked about, you briefly touched on the army there. Uh, I do have a, a question here about uh, sort of the breakdown of Ethiopia that serving in the army. Uh, do most people uh, engage uh, just as the, the rest of uh, Israeli society? And how is the, the situation for Ethiopian Israelis in the IDF? Well, uh, I didn't tell you, but um, another brother of mine, uh, he became the first Ethiopian officer in the army in 1986. He was a paratrooper. And at the beginning, most of the Ethiopian Jews were motivated to go to combat unit. Uh, but that changed as well, because it changed in the society. Uh, not, only on, not only the Ethiopian Jews, but everyone are going and serving in the army in different position, in different uh, 
uh, uh, uh, um, in the Air Force or in different places. Um, it's very important, not only because we are Ethiopian Jews, as an Israeli, you have to go to the army. That's like the, the only thing you can do to bring back to the country you are living in. And as people who live here, we understand how much important it is to go to the army. And my community, we are serving, we are going, 90% of us going to the army. I'm still doing reserve duty. I have another three years. Um, and, and it's part of being Israeli. If you want to be Israeli, that's part of being Israeli to serve in the Air Force, uh, in the Air Force, in the Army. Uh, so I, I'm happy that still uh, young people from my community are serving, are going. Uh, and that's very important because when you do Army, you, you like, you feel equal to the people who live here, right? Like you, you did something that they did. You defend, you did, you, you gave three years of your life for the country. So you feel equal. And that's very important if you want to be part of the Israeli society to feel equal. No, it's, it's fundamental. I think, unfortunately, we're, we're pretty much out of time. But I do just have one more, one more question here for you. Uh, the uh, Israeli borders are finally uh, open again for, uh, for, for tourists, for, certainly from, from the UK. Uh, we're looking forward to, to making our way back to Israel uh, when, when possible. I'm looking forward to my third jab, hopefully, uh, soon. Um, but can you tell us what's one stop on, on one of your tours that you are most excited for, for us to see? What do we really have to, to go and see? Well, I'm always saying to you guys are not tourists. You are our brothers and sisters. But when you're coming here, most of the people are going to the two main cities, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Big cities, and it's nice and it's very important to visit them. But if you want to see the real Israel, you don't go to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. You have to go maybe up to the north or down to the south. If you want to see the people, the real people, come to the south. Come visit Be'er Sheva. See the first Ethiopian synagogue of Ethiopian Jews in Israel. Come see the community. Come taste the food. Come dance to the Ethiopian music. That's the beauty. And I hope that most of the people here uh, will be able to come as soon as possible. If, and if you come in next time, do me a favor, come visit me and come visit my community in Beersheba. You have the link to my uh, website um, in the chat. You have all the details over there. Come visit us. And I'm, 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 I'm sure you will see something that you didn't see before. And that's very, very important. And it will, it will open your eyes and, and, and the head to the, the state of Israel the way you didn't knew. Yeah, well, I absolutely... You are more, more than welcome. <laughs> I, and I'm sure uh, many of the people watching this evening will, uh, will take you up on that. Also, Naftali, thank you so much for, for your time this evening, for the presentation, for taking the time uh, to answer our questions. I'm sorry to, to the people for the question um, that were asked, that, that we didn't have time uh, to, to ask. Um, and maybe we'll be able to, to send some more uh, through to you. But I certainly hope that we'll be able to speak to you uh, again soon. Um, and I know that we will also do what we can uh, to help uh, share and, and spread your story. Also really looking forward to finding out more about this uh, Australian uh, movie situation. Um, just a, a few closing words before before we end this this event, really. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Efrat Perry uh, and George Baroda from the Embassy of Israel uh, for gathering, uh, for partnering, sorry, with the, with the Board of Deputies uh, for this just fascinating event. Um, online events can be uh, somewhat easier to put together. Uh, they still take uh, work. And so thank you to everyone at the, the Embassy team and the Board staff team 
for, the, for your work in putting this together. Uh, I love these these online events because it means that so many people are able uh, to equally engage in them. Um, Naftali, we might not have been able to, to fly you in. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's great that we're able to, to virtually uh, chat, chat in this way. Um, and again, thank you so much uh, for such an engaging and educational uh, presentation. As British Jews, we're, we're a proud community. We feel a, a great connection, historic, emotional, familiar, uh, for, for the state of Israel in, in all of its diversity. Tonight's event has shown a well-known applause to Ethiopian Jewry. Uh, and to quote you, Natali, uh, the story of Ethiopian Jewry in Israel is a unique tale of suffering, perseverance, and importantly, fulfillment. There's so much that we can learn and be inspired by, by you and the history and perseverance of the Ethiopian Jewish community, who make up such a vital element of Israeli society. So thank you again, uh, Naftali, for, for your insight. I'm going to say you know, thank you and thank you and thank you, because really it just has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, as we continue to navigate our, our new normal, uh, the board will continue to strive to facilitate events like this. Um, and if there is a silver lining in these uh, new times, uh, then it's the increased activity that we've witnessed between peoples, across national boundaries and throughout the world. I'm really grateful uh, to everyone who joined us tonight on the Zoom call uh, and on the live stream, both on our page and, and the Israeli embassies. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it um, as, as much as I did. Uh, wish everybody a, a fantastic rest of, rest of your evening. Uh, thank you again for coming. Thank you again, Naftali, so much uh, for everything this evening. Um, all the best to, to, to you and to yours. And um, everybody, 